As always, open your Bibles, folks. <laughs> there was a certain group in the book of Acts. I think it's in Acts 17. Paul left one place and he went to another place called Berea. And he said those in Berea were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they received the things that he said with all readiness of mind, but they also checked to see if what Paul was saying was true and accurate. They received what Paul said. They said, man, this sounds like good news. If what you're saying is true, we want it. But we're not just going to take it blindly. We're not just going to take your word for it. We're going to check out to see in the scriptures. They searched the scriptures to see whether those things were so. And so even the great apostle Paul, whom back then he had such a reputation that everybody knew God had spoken to him directly. Paul speaks, you listen. But these people were noble, Paul says. They were noble. Because when we spoke the word, they said, that sounds good. I'm going to check. Yeah, that's, yeah, that makes sense. So that's why I always encourage you. Take your phones, take your Bibles, open them up. Read along with me as I teach the Bible so that you know I'm not trying to take you for a ride. I'm not trying to deceive you or trick you or pressure you to come anywhere or go anywhere or do anything. I want you to see the words of God for yourself. So my uh, usual way of teaching in way that I think the Apostle Paul taught. It's verse by verse, book by book. When the Apostle Paul went around from place to place, he established churches. He didn't go there and set up a building. He didn't go there and say, okay, folks, we're going to get some brick and mortar. Let's start building a building so that people can come here and we'll tell them some good stories. That's not what he did at all. He went into the synagogues or into the marketplaces or into the highways, wherever he needed to go, wherever people were there, and he engaged them and told them of the risen Savior. He told them of Jesus and how he had died for our sins and that he had risen again and that he had purchased a freedom for us. And the people that believed this were filled with the Holy Spirit. Even to this day, people that believe this message are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when people that are full of the Holy Spirit meet another person with a full, that's full of the Holy Spirit, there's something that just happens. If you're one of these people, you know what I'm talking about. It's just there's a click. There's something there that just registers within the two of you, and you just want to be together. And so the church started gathering together. That's what they wanted to do. Paul encouraged them to continue to gather together. But he didn't need to force them to get together in a building. They would meet in homes week after week, sometimes day after day, studying the scriptures. And the people that Paul was preaching to, for the large majority of them, were not Jewish people. They were not familiar with the Old Testament passages. They were not familiar with the law and with Moses. They had maybe heard about him, heard about some of the teachings. There might have been a mixture of Jews in each church, but they weren't very familiar with the words of God. And if you remember, uh, even... Two, three hundred years ago, there was a lot more illiterate people than there are today. So if you go back 2,000 years ago, I would say probably well over half of the population could not read. So Paul would write them a letter. He had gone there, preached the gospel. They gathered together week after week, day after day. And then he would leave and he would write epistles to them. So the book of Colossians is where I want you to turn to. The book of Colossians is not a book, it's a letter. It's like a literal letter that Paul had somebody pen for him. He spoke to somebody. Somebody wrote these words down and they sent it, rolled it up in a scroll, put a seal on it, sent it to the church at Colossae. And they said, I want you to read this to the church. Now, they did not gather in front of a building and read to the building because the building is not the church. They read it to the church. That's us. All believers make up the church. And so the church at Colossae was the Colossian church. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, he always introduces himself this same way, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother. So he introduces himself. He says, this is who I am. I'm, I'm an apostle. And the word apostle literally just means sent one. I've been sent by Jesus Christ by the will of God. So I didn't come based on some church sent me to go. I'm not working for some ministry. Jesus Christ himself, the will of God, has sent me to you. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine having that authority? I recently was ordained as a minister in the church at Springfield, here locally. But I've been preaching the gospel for ten years before that. So I don't suddenly, now that I'm a minister feel that I'm now qualified or have give, been given the authority to preach the gospel. I believe Jesus Christ has commissioned us 
as his servants, as his messengers, to deliver the gospel to other people. And we can do that with absolute full authority, the same way the Apostle Paul did. We have every right and full authority to preach the gospel. Sometimes people ask, well, how dare you do this? What right do you have? How can you baptize somebody? How can you marry someone? How can you do all these things if you're not an ordained minister? Well, I was ordained, just not by the local church. I was ordained by Jesus Christ. And he's given me all authority in heaven and earth to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But Paul had something even more specific and more um, for him than what I have. Paul, as you know, he was on his way to, to Damascus to slaughter Christians and to put them in prison. And he was knocked off his horse. And he was converted in an instant when Jesus came to him and spoke to him and said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And so he had a special ministry. Paul, Jesus said, I'm going to send you to the nations of the world all around. And you're going to know what it means to suffer for my namesake. You're going to go and stand before kings and judges and all these different things. And you're going to go to all the world. And so Paul said, I was an apostle sent by Jesus Christ specifically to the Gentile people by the will of God. And he says, Timotheus, our brother here, he's with us as well. To the saints, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This would be an awesome introduction if you didn't understand the Bible. If you hadn't heard Bible terminology before, and if this was new words to you, if you were illiterate, and if you were one of the castaways, barbarians, many people back then had no hope in this world. They were um, barbaric, is why, what the Jews called them. They called them barbarians. And when you think of barbarians today, you think of those people out in the Amazon that are living like with just little loincloths, and they've got these blow dart guns, and they're painting themselves all up, and they got their ears all stretched out and noses. I don't, like, people do weird things out there. We call them barbarians. You picture those kinds of people, and here God is sending a message to them. He says, Paul, this is me writing to you, to the saints. What is the word saints? That word saints is the same word that's translated holy in the, in the word Holy Spirit. Can you imagine stand, sitting there in this congregation looking around you, recognizing most of us are not very holy. Most of us have been awful sinners. And here the Apostle Paul says, to the saints. To the saints and faithful brethren. And I don't think he's classifying them as two different people. Some were saints and some were faithful brethren. He says, you guys are saints and your faithful brethren which are at Colossae. We are in Christ. That's how we become brethren. That's how we become saints. That's how we become holy. That's how we become accepted by God, is in Christ Jesus. It's all right there in that one little introduction. We just skip over those things. To the saints, faithful brethren, which are in Christ Jesus, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we don't even read it. There's right there in that one verse, you could preach a whole sermon about who we are. We're now holy. We're saints. We're brothers. And we're in Christ. We're brothers and sisters. We're a family that's in Jesus Christ. And then after that, he tells, after telling them who he, they are now are in Christ, he says, grace be unto you. Any of you guys in need of grace? Grace would be unmerited favor. Meaning that you did nothing to deserve some good in your life. Sometimes we feel like, I deserve better in my life, Right? This isn't right. It shouldn't be happening to me. I've been doing it so well lately. Why are all these bad things happening to me? Well, this is the opposite of that. This is when you realize that you don't deserve any good, and yet grace is being lavished upon you. And I'm not talking about you got new shoes and a nice haircut and good clothes and a, and a good car to drive. That's not. He says grace is God's favor upon you. Grace is God's blessings upon you when you didn't deserve it. Grace unto you and... What else do you get from him? Peace. Peace. What does the world need? The world needs peace. You look around and everybody's in turmoil. The uh, suicide rates are crazy. Everybody's dissatisfied with what they have. Millionaires are not satisfied with what they have. Billionaires are still looking for more. Nobody's satisfied. Everybody's learning, yearning for more and more and more. They're never at peace. They're never at rest. And not only do they not have rest in their souls, but they don't have peace with God the Father. When they try to approach God, the heavens are like iron above them and they can't even pray. You try to reach out to God and say, God, please help me, but you don't feel like He's even there. You don't feel like He's even listening. 
You don't have peace with God. But he says to you guys now, to the brethren and faithful saints in Christ Jesus, grace and peace. So he's speaking very comfortable words to them. The Colossian saints, as they hear this letter being read, they're letting each word soak in. They probably read this chapter over and over and over again until they had memorized it, many of them. Because they wanted to hear these beautiful words again and again. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, when do you usually start praying for people? I know when I usually do, when I hear about how bad they're doing. Did you hear about brother so-and-so? They're really struggling. They fell back into sin, or they're sick, or they're, they lost their job, or their wife left, or something bad happened to them. Oh, we should pray for them. And we should, rightfully so. But Paul says in verse 4, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. So Paul hears a rumor through the rumor mill. One saint tells another saint, tells another saint. The word gets back to Paul. He says, guess what, Paul? The Colossians that you preached to originally, they're doing great. They love each other. They're rejoicing in the faith. They are um, full of faith and full of love toward one another. Paul says, I better pray for those folks. No, no, didn't you hear me? They're doing really well. Yeah, I'm going to have to really get on my knees tonight and make sure I keep these people in prayers. Who do you think the devil's after? The guy who's down and out, doesn't feel any good? Or the guy that's bold in the forefront, standing before the enemy, preaching the gospel, loving his brothers and loving his sisters? That's the guy the enemy's after. So if you want to pray for somebody, find somebody who you see as rejoicing, full of faith, full of love towards one another, and just say, God, bless that individual. Help them to keep up what they're doing, not to lose heart, not to lose faith, not to lose focus, to continue to love. God, give them peace, give them grace, lavish this stuff upon them, keep them uh, maneuvering, keep them working in the ministry. Those are the people we need to pray for. The others will be helped, those that are struggling will be helped more by that guy being bold in his faith than by you praying for the guy that's weak and having hard times. So Paul knew what he was doing. He didn't have things backwards. He said, when I heard of your faith and your love towards all the brethren, I didn't stop praying for you. From that day forward, I said, i got to pray for these folks. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. If you don't know what to pray for, when you are standing before God, bowing your knees before Him, whatever, however you pray before God, and you're thinking, what, what should I pray for? Give thanks. It, you can never go wrong with just giving thanks. I would say probably 90% of my prayers are just giving thanks. Whether it's for day-to-day things, God, thanks for this blessing, thanks for this thing that I have, thanks for that. But more so than that, God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the saints that I have in my life. Thank you for the church. Thank you for so-and-so. Thank you for so-and-so. And And God's just being lavished with praise and thanksgiving. And the Bible actually calls it a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Paul said, I prayed for you and I gave thanks for you since the day we heard of your faith. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, to all the saints, even the ugly ones. That may sound funny, but it's true. Sometimes there's an ugly person. Sometimes there's a person that's just quirky and strange and not very socially acceptable. They're just weird. He says, you had love unto all the saints. Remember in Romans he said, condescend to men of low estate. Even those that don't look as cool as you do. Aren't as pretty as you girls are. Just condescend to them. He loves all the saints. He said, when I heard of that, I said, i just I got to pray for these people. He prayed also for the hope, verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. <coughs> Have you ever heard the Mennonites say, we can bless hopen? We can just hope so. That's the only thing we can do is just hope for the best. If we die, we just hope that God will be merciful to us. That's not where our hope is. We don't have that kind of hope. We have a sure hope. Our hope is laid up for us in heaven. It's like making a reservation at a hotel and getting the confirmation number, writing it down. You print off the receipt, perhaps, and you go to the motel. You don't think, well, I hope I got a motel room. No, you have a motel room. 
Look at the receipt. Look at the paper. It's got the nice little picture of their logo and everything. It's got the date. It's got the time. It's got everything there. You just go to the motel and say, look, here's, can I have my room, please? Sure. Here's your keys. Everything's set. It's all paid for. Go ahead. That's the kind of reservation we have. That's the kind of hope we have. We have a hope laid up for us in heaven in the down payment has been given to us. The down payment is God's Holy Spirit. The moment you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit is given unto us and we have that hope laid up for us in heaven. I love the way he says this next part here in verse 5. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. This is what you heard when you got saved. You heard the word. You have to hear the word to get saved. Of the truth. The words that you hear can't be mixed with falsity or falsehood. You can't hear some wrong message. You need to hear the truth. And the truth needs to be good news. The word of the truth of the gospel. The word gospel was not back then. It was not a religious buzzword like it is today. Today when you hear the word gospel... You just think, oh, that's Bible. No, the word gospel literally means good news. Good news, the town is having a fair and you're all welcome to come. Free admission. It's good news. Simple. Good news. The word of the truth that comes to you, that makes you enter into this faith, is good news. If what you have been told about coming to God and entering into fellowship with Jesus Christ has burdened you? Has made you think, I'll never be able to do it. I will never be good enough. I've tried and it's not working. Then you haven't heard the good news. The good news should lift up your soul. The good news should make you think, really? The good news should make you say, wow, this is awesome. That's what the good news should do to your soul. When the good news, when the word of the truth of the gospel is delivered to you, it should set you free. It should tell you about this hope that's reserved for you in heaven and it should liberate your soul in regards to getting to God. You should no longer feel a blockage above you. You should no longer feel like you're guilty before God. The good news will deliver you from all that. Verse 6. This good news, this gospel which has come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Now, I don't know how many of you have been saved right here listening to the gospel being preached, whether by me or Willie or John, but I know that some of you have. But I've never told you to uh, uh, make a profession. I've never told you to pray to God and ask Him to save you. I've never told you to come to me and I'll pray for you. I'll do some great thing for you that will deliver you. All I've done is preach the word of the truth of the gospel and some of you have been delivered from sins in your life. Delivered from shame and guilt and fear and you've been delivered to having this hope that's in heaven reserved for you. And it's brought forth fruit. All of a sudden I see you guys doing good things. I see you guys rejoicing in the truth. I see you guys bright and cheery eyed and full of faith and love and doing good things one for another. And that's the gospel is producing fruit. I don't need to tell you to do good things. The book of Hebrews says that we no longer need to teach one another saying, Know the Lord. If I deliver the good message to you, the good news to you, the fruit will be there. It's a natural outworking of believing the gospel. The word of the truth of the gospel will bring out good fruits in you. Since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So from the day that you hear this message, I don't care how deep in sins you were, I know a guy that was totally hooked on drugs, and I've told you guys this story before, to the point where he had to have shots in his arm every single day or in his backside. He had to constantly be feeding himself or else he would go into cramps and spasms and he just wouldn't be able to control himself. He had to have his fix. And he heard the word of the truth of the gospel and it immediately produced fruits in him. He was able to walk clean from, from, from drugs 
and totally free from it, totally free from the cravings, totally free from the, the, the cramps and the shakes and whatever else you might get from that kind of thing. And many of us here can testify in one way or another that as soon as we believed, the, from the day that we heard the truth, we were delivered and we were able to produce, not we were able to, but God produced fruit in our lives. It's automatic. The fruit will come. Once you're a believer, you don't have to work hard to produce fruits. It's what you naturally want to do. It's the outworking of believing the word of the truth of the gospel. Since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth. Verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. So he says, you guys heard this truth from me, but you also heard it from Epaphras, who's been there with you ministering day after day after day. And I find it interesting that he makes mention of Epaphras, almost as if to give him a little bit of respect in the circles. He says, you know, you guys heard this from me, but you've also been hearing it from Billy. I've heard him say it to you. And so now automatically everybody in the room thinks, oh, I should listen to Billy a little more. This is, this is how we should do things for one for another. If you're ministering to somebody, you can give them a heads up. Listen to this guy too, because he's going to tell you the truth as well. He knows the truth, and he'll be able to relay it to you quite well. So listen to this guy. But he says he's a dear fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras is the one that relayed the message to the Apostle Paul that the Colossians were doing well and in faith and in love and all those good things. So he said he relayed that message to us. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, again, they're not struggling, they're not having a hard time, they're doing really well. They're all rejoicing, they're walking in the truth, they're believing the gospel, they're producing fruit, they're loving one another. Since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Here's a lot of answers for you guys when you're wondering, what do I pray? How do I pray for other individuals? Right here. God, thank you for this guy that he's so full of faith and full of love and full of patience and full of hope. And all these things are there in him. I pray, God, that you would give him a desire to be filled with knowledge. What does that mean? That means you're going to dig into the Word. These guys, a lot of them couldn't read. You guys all can. So we get the opportunity and the um, privilege of looking into the Word of God ourselves. Back then, they would just sit at somebody's feet and listen and listen and listen and soak it all in. As Peter says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Like a newborn babe desires milk. One day I hope you guys, you men and women, get the experience of having a little baby and watching your wife put it up to her breast. I'm not being perverted. It's very beautiful. And see that little baby just for all it's worth trying with desperately to get milk. That's all they want. They just want milk. Give me milk. Give me milk. I want to grow. And they grow. They grow faster than anybody. Like just... It only takes a few weeks. You look, you see another baby, and you're like, what in the world happened to that guy? Back then, he was just this little guy. Now look at him. He's huge. That's what we're supposed to be like. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Increase in knowledge. Fill your minds with gospel messages. Find good gospel preachers. Listen to them in your drive as you go. Listen to them in your, on your phones, whatever, while you're working if you can. Whatever you're doing, I don't know when you can, but you should find opportunities to fill your mind with the Word of Christ and the knowledge of the truth of the Gospel. The more knowledge you have of Christ, the more you can grow in grace. Now, again, last, like I told you guys a few weeks ago, we're not looking to grow closer to God. We're as close as we're ever going to be in Christ Jesus. But we're looking to expand our knowledge in the grace of God. I've been saved now for about 11, 12 years. And I feel like I'm just kind of starting to get a grasp on what grace and the beauty of the gospel really is. I would have said that five years ago too. But now it's like, man, this is awesome. I'm learning more about it all the time. The words of Christ are becoming richer and fuller and deeper. And it's like, man, it's everywhere. The gospel, the good news, it's all over the place. Jesus Christ is in every page. And you learn more and more and more. He says, I want you to grow in knowledge. What else did he say here? Filled with knowledge in his, of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
Why do you need knowledge and spiritual understanding? Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So how do you produce more fruits? It's not by putting yourself under laws. It's not by telling yourself you need to work harder and try more. It's by being filled with the knowledge of His will. I feel like the more I get to know about God's overall plan of how He created the world in the beginning... And how he knew that Adam and Eve would sin and fall. And how he saw the Jews stumbling around under the law, trying to please him by keeping the Ten Commandments. He knew they never would. And finally sending his own son, Jesus Christ, to do the work for us. And then having him put to death so that he could be raised again to new life. So that he could give us the gift of eternal life. The more I learn about that, the more I just want to do good. You don't need to tell me to go and preach the gospel. You don't need to tell me to read my Bible. The more I learn about it, the more I want to. It's a fruit. It's the natural result of getting to know Him. So He says, I want you to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You know, we're not saved by our walk before the Lord. We're not saved by pleasing God. We're saved by Jesus Christ pleasing God. But everybody that's saved wants to please Him anyway. There's no way you can avoid it. Once He's saved you, and He's redeemed you, and He's washed you, and He's cleansed you, and He's called you His own, all you want to do from that point on is please Him. Before you know it, all of a sudden you put on something and you're like, would this please God? What? Before you never thought of that. When you do this or you do that, would this please God? Is God pleased by this thing that I'm doing? Yeah, I feel feel like God is pleased by this. But it says later on in the book of Colossians, He says, whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, Or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You ever thought about eating or drinking to the glory of God? Whatsoever you do. He says, I want you to walk worthy unto the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And what else? Increasing in the knowledge of God. Didn't he already say that? Must be kind of important. He wants us to increase in the knowledge of the will of God. And he wants us to abound and be fruitful in every good work. Why? So that you can increase in the knowledge of God. So it's like full circle. You'll increase in knowledge so that you can produce good works and produce fruit. And when you produce fruit, it'll help you increase in your knowledge of God. And so there's this cycle where it's all about knowing God. When you know God, the works come. The fruit happens. That you might walk worthy unto the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's a lot of words right there. I love the King James Bible and the way it's worded, the beautiful use of words. And each word we could dig into and spend a long time on. I can't spend that much time on each one. But he says, I want you to be strengthened with all might. According to what? According to his glorious power. What is his glorious power? Is that, I mean, is that just because he's strong? No, his glorious power is what raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You need to be strengthened with might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness those are three huge huge things patience is not the ability to wait for somebody as i've shared with you before if that was biblical patience i sometimes would not have very much of it because when i'm waiting for my wife and kids to get ready and i'm ready to go i don't have a lot of patience and that's not the kind of patience he's wishing upon us here. It's a good attribute to have. It's a good thing to practice. But the patience he's talking about here is waiting for the coming of Christ. That was the command that he constantly gave to the church. He said, I want you to wait patiently. Hold fast to the gospel. Wait for his return. Wait for his coming back. That's patience. And long-suffering. The Colossian Christians, I don't know how they were, but many of the Christians in those days, when they accepted the gospel, they were rejected by their friends and families. They were rejected by their social gatherings, rejected by their uh, religious organizations. They were rejected by all people around them, and they suffered, but they did it joyfully. 
with all joyfulness, they suffered long, long suffering. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. What's an inheritance? I hope none of you guys have received your inheritance yet from your parents. Some of, some people do when their parents die early and things don't go well with their parents, they receive an inheritance. We have been made partakers. We've been made, not just made partakers, but we've been made meat to be partakers. That means we've been qualified to be made partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The inheritance that God is going to give to his people in that day is given to us because we are made meat to be partakers of that. We are qualified to partake of this inheritance because of what God has done for us. And he's going to tell us how he made us qualified, how he made us meet to be partakers of this inheritance. Verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Beautiful, beautiful verse. One to memorize, put in your mind and remember all the time. I love the word hath. Who hath delivered us. From the power of darkness. You ever feel like you're being bound by the power of darkness and you just can't do good, you can't get right, you can't get over some issue? It's not true. You are not bound by the power of darkness. Try to eat a sit nice, okay? The verse doesn't say who will deliver you from the power of darkness or is delivering you from the power of darkness. You don't need to pray for deliverance from the power of darkness. You don't need to ask God to deliver you from the power of darkness. It says he hath delivered you from the power of darkness. Awesome, isn't it? The power of the devil that used to be upon you, whether it was uh, drugs or alcohol or pornography or lying or stealing or cheating or gossiping or whatever it might be, whatever used to grip you and kept you down and kept you guilty and kept you condemned before God, it's been delivered. You've been delivered from the power of darkness, not just from those sins. Those are minor things. You've been delivered from the devil, the power of darkness himself. The, the devil has no power over you any longer. I heard of one preacher that said back in the 60s, he dealt a lot with um, devil-possessed people. And he said every time he saw a devil-possessed person, this is not talking about these modern-day devils that people talk about, how oh, he has a devil of smoke or the devil of lust or anything like that. That's not the devil. The devil, when you see a devil in somebody, it'll be just like in the scriptures where people were foaming at their mouth or throwing themselves into the fire or speaking with weird voices out of their throats. And there's literally a devil inside of them. He said every time he saw that, he started laughing. Not because it was funny. Not because he was laughing at that person, but because he was excited that here was another opportunity for the power of God to show itself strong because we have been delivered from the power of darkness. He would start laughing and he would say, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of that man. And it works. Jesus Christ has conquered the devil. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath, again, that word hath, past tense, hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. You're not looking to belong to God. You're not yearning to become one of God's children. He has delivered you and He has translated you. What do you think of when you hear the word translated? Any ideas? Like a dictionary, like an English. From one language to another. Another word that often comes to mind is um, uh, teleported. When I, you're transported from here to there. You get on a transport. You get from one place to the other. Well, the moment you believe the gospel, since the day you heard of it and believed the grace of God, you were translated You were taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed in the kingdom of His dear Son. You were taken from being one of God's enemies to being 
His dear Son. From working against God with your life, with your sin, with your guilt, with your ugliness that you were, to now being His lovely child that He loves very dearly. That's, that's a miracle, folks. If you've experienced that, you've experienced one of the greatest miracles ever to be seen. To be taken from who you were. And if you don't see yourself as ugly, you haven't seen yourself yet. I might not see you as ugly. Your friends might not see you as ugly. But think of it how God sees it. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. He knows your intentions. And He's seen everything that you've ever done. To take you from who you were and translate you immediately into the kingdom of His dear Son is a miracle. It's a huge miracle. In whom, the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption is to purchase something. God purchased you to become a part of His kingdom. How did He purchase you? Through His blood. Through His blood, folks. If you think the gospel sounds too easy and too fun and too... too um, some people call it easy believism. Oh, you just believe that all you got to do is believe and then you're good and it's like it doesn't even cost you anything. No, it doesn't cost me anything, but it cost God Christ's blood. It costed Him His own Son's life to redeem you to Himself, to translate you into the kingdom of His dear Son. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Have your sins been forgiven? In Romans chapter 5 we read, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sins. Are you still going to God and asking Him to forgive you? Or or are you absolutely sure that when you go before God, that you have no sins standing in your way? Do you have that peace? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? You can know it. You can have that peace, that assurance. Not by being a good person, not by coming to youth, not by preaching, not by teaching, not by reading your Bible, not by praying or fasting or any number of things. It's by hearing the word of the truth of the gospel. This very message that I'm delivering to you right now about Jesus Christ, through His bloodshed, you can have absolute and complete forgiveness of sins. Under the Old Covenant, we call it the Old Testament. You know how the Bible is separated from Old Testament and New Testament? It's very significant. Under the Old Testament, if you sinned, you had to bring an animal and cut its throat and watch its life blood shed out onto the ground or onto the altar, wherever it might have been, in order to get your sins forgiven for a period of time. And if you sinned again, you got to get another animal. And if you sinned again, you got another animal. How many animals would you guys have killed by now? Under the New Covenant, it's not to be that way. Under the New Covenant, all your sins have been taken away. All of them. Some people will say, well, that's just my past sins. How many of your sins were in past when Jesus died? Oh, never mind. They were all in the future, weren't they? How many of your sins did Jesus die for? All of them. This is good news. This is the gospel, guys. This is something that should deliver your soul and make you realize once and for all that I'm at peace with God. There's nothing standing in my way anymore. This message has been preached to people living out in Papua New Guinea. I watched a video. If you ever get a chance to watch it, it's called e Tau. So check with me for spelling. It's a weird word. But he preached the gospel to them over a period of several months. When they finally heard the word of the truth of the gospel, when he finally delivered this message to them, they literally jumped up and down and screamed and shouted and cried and laughed for two hours straight. Nobody could keep them still. They were rejoicing and celebrating in their souls. Because their sins were forgiven. My sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. If you don't have that celebrating in your soul, then maybe you don't realize how sinful you are. This is good news. This is the best of news. This is a new covenant, a new way of God relating to His people. We're not under the old covenant anymore. We have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
I know we're kind of stopping right in the middle of something because he's not done yet. Even his sentence hasn't stopped. If you ever notice, he just he's like the king of run-on sentences. The end of the verse, semicolon. Next verse, semicolon. Next verse, colon. 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 Then finally, at the end of chapter, verse 17, there's a period. Paul takes a deep breath, and he's ready to go again. I think he was a little long-winded. In fact, we know he was a little long-winded because in the book of Acts, when he was preaching one night, well past midnight, if you ever think I preach for too long and you get tired of hearing me talk, Paul preached well past midnight to the point where one of the young men sitting in the window fell out of the window and died. Paul went down and raised him from the dead, went back up and preached some more. I, wonder if he was awake after that. I think after that he stayed awake. So I'm going to stop right there and we're going to talk about the image of of the invisible God a little bit next time. But I love the book of Colossians. To me, it's, it's so fruitful, so flavorful. It's like you can taste it in your mind. It's just full of these words that if you were to dwell on each word individually, you'd get like a buzz on each one just because you, you think about them. Redemption through His blood, forgiveness of sins from the power of darkness translated to the kingdom. of like just so many beautiful words that if you have time to sit and consider and dwell and meditate upon... You'll be excited. You'll recognize the goodness and grace of God.